California has the nation's largest state government budget. It's probably not too surprising, considering that California would be one of the world's largest economies on its own, if it were its own country. And after a period of extreme budget problems that led to the recall of Governor Gray Davis and very low approval ratings for Governor Schwarzenegger in his second term, California's budget has improved significantly over the past decade. The state appears to have learned some lessons from the budget shortfalls of the Great Recession and has taken steps to ensure a more stable budget the next time that the state encounters an economic downturn. So let's look at how the state takes in and spends money. California law dictates a standard process for developing a budget each year. It begins in the executive branch, where government agencies submit their proposals for funding for the upcoming year to the Department of Finance, which acts as a sort of clearinghouse for evaluating budget requests and coordinating the governor's budget proposal. The governor's office evaluates these requests, but can obviously make changes to them based on the governor's policy priorities. The governor then submits a budget to the state legislature by January 10th of each year. This proposal must contain a balanced budget, meaning proposed spending much ma must match up with anticipated revenues. The timing of this proposal coincides with the governor's annual State of the State speech, in which they lay out their priorities for the coming year. At this point, action on the budget moves to the state Senate and assembly budget committees, which use the governor's proposal as a baseline, but can be changed rather significantly by lawmakers who have their own spending ideas. Also critical at this stage is the work of the Legislative Analyst's Office, the nonpartisan experts who work to provide objective technical advice to the legislature. The LAO analyzes the governor's proposal and often makes recommendations for achieving the state's policy goals in more cost-effective ways. As the legislature works on putting together a budget bill that can gain majority support in both the Assembly and the Senate, the Department of Finance submits what's called the May Revision, or May Revise. This reflects changes in projected income from various tax sources based on how economic conditions might have changed since the governor's original proposal was developed. This highlights how sensitive state government budgets are to the health of the economy. A slowdown in the economy can substantially reduce the ta tax revenue coming into the state, meaning spending cuts are sometimes necessary in order to balance the budget. California law mandates that the budget must be passed by the legislature by June 15th so that the budget will be in place at the start of the fiscal year, which begins on July 1st. In the not very distant past, it was commonplace for the legislature to miss this deadline, especially after the dot-com bust and the Great Recession of the early 2000s. At that time, California law required a two-thirds majority in each chamber of the legislature in order to pass the budget. This required Democrats and Republicans to agree on tax and spending priorities, and often the budget would be delayed for months as it would get caught up in partisan fights. California was the only state in the country with this supermajority budget requirement, and it led many to argue that the state had become virtually ungovernable. Ultimately, California voters approved Proposition 25 in the year 2010, changing state law to only require a simple majority to enact the budget. Every year since this provision has been in effect, the state has passed its budget on time. Finally, once the legislature passes the budget, it moves back to the governor, who may sign it, veto it completely, or sign it but with line item vetoes, striking out individual spending items. California governors have signed the budget with few or no line item vetoes in recent years. Because they are heavily involved in negotiations with the legislature throughout the process, it's unusual for the legislature to pass a budget that is not broadly supported by the governor. California's state budget is separated into different funds. The largest of these is the general fund, which is mostly at the discretion of the legislature and the governor to determine how that money should be spent each year. Special funds reflect money in the budget 
that by law is directed towards some specific spending category. For instance, cigarette tax revenue goes into a special fund set aside to pay for anti-smoking campaigns, and gasoline tax revenue is allocated specifically to transportation projects. The governor and the legislature do not have the power to divert these funds to other purposes. Bond funds are used to pay for capital intensive projects with high upfront costs. By issuing bonds, the project can be paid back for gradually over a certain number of years. This is a relatively small category at the state level, but makes up a much more important component of local government project funding in California. Finally, federal funds come into the state budget from the federal government to pay for programs such as Medicaid that have cost sharing components between the states and the federal government. In terms of spending priorities, the state budget is heavily tilted toward a small number of different policy areas. The five listed on this slide account for 82% of the total state budget. The two biggest areas by far for state government spending are health and human services and K through 12 education. This mirrors a national trend, but is especially strong in California as healthcare costs have risen and as the state government has had to provide more and more money for education that used to come from local governments before Proposition 13 placed strict limits on property taxes that used to go toward that purpose. Other major spending categories in the state include higher education, corrections, and transportation. As recently as the late 1970s, the state of California spent six times as much money on higher education as it did on corrections, whereas now they're almost equal. The UC and CSU systems, two of the top public university systems in the world, used to be a substantial bargain for California students with relatively low tuition rates. But over the past few decades, whenever recessions have made balancing the budget difficult, the state has shifted more and more of the costs of higher education onto the students themselves through higher tuition. Meanwhile, the drug war and get tough on crime policies of the 1980s and 90s had the effect of dramatically increasing the state's spending on prisons. This is a rather stark reminder of how government budgets reflect a society's priorities. Most people value both higher education and effective criminal justice, but when money was tight and trade-offs were made, the state's emphasis on strict criminal justice is at least partly responsible for why you, my students, are paying more for your education today than when I was lucky enough to attend a public university in California before these budget changes were made. California's state budget is heavily reliant upon a small number of revenue sources, particularly the personal income tax. Income tax represents 51% of all the money that comes into the state treasury. This is the money that gets taken out of your paycheck each payday. It's relatively easy for the state to collect and in good economic times is a robust source of revenue for the state. The second largest revenue category is the sales tax, which represents 19% of the revenue brought in by the state. And third and much smaller is the corporation tax, which is assessed on companies' profits. The trouble is that all three of these revenue sources are highly sensitive to economic cycles, making California's state budget particularly vulnerable to recessions. When recessions hit, people lose their jobs, meaning income tax collections go down. In bad economic times, people cut back on their spending, meaning sales tax revenue goes down. And in recessions, corporate profits dry up, meaning corporation tax collections plummet. The state's reliance on these sources of revenue exacerbated the budget problems of the last two recessions, resulting in spending cuts, and accounting maneuvers that place burdens on future taxpayers. California's annual budgets are shaped in large measure by a number of initiatives that have been approved by the voters over the years. I'm going to highlight just a few of the most important ones, beginning with Proposition 13, which was approved in 1978. It placed strict limits on property taxes, which have historically been the primary revenue source for local government services, including K through 12 education. In 
as local school districts struggled with funding in the wake of Proposition 13, more and more of the responsibility for school funding shifted from local governments to the state. This was accelerated by Proposition 98 in 1988, which mandated that at least 39% of the state's general fund revenue must be spent on K through 12 schools and that school funding must increase each year. While K through 12 funding is certainly very important, the effect of Prop 98 was to take control of a large share of the state budget out of the hands of legislators, meaning that when cuts needed to be made, other programs, such as higher education, have experienced deeper cuts. As I mentioned earlier in this video, Proposition 25 was enacted in 2010 to remove the two-thirds requirement for budget approval and allowing a simple majority vote in the Assembly and the Senate to pass the budget. This proposition also specified that if the legislature fails to pass the budget by the June 15th deadline, legislatures will lose their salaries for each day the budget is late. Perhaps not coincidentally, the budget has never been late since this provision has been in effect. And finally, one of the more far-sighted budget-related initiatives approved by voters is Proposition 2, passed in 2014, establishing a robust rainy day fund to be used as a reserve. The purpose of this fund is to create something like a savings account for state government to be used when revenues decline during a recession so the government isn't forced into making the same drastic spending cuts that occurred during the last recession. Funds have been added to this account each year since 2014, and current reserves would now offset over half the projected revenue shortfall of an average recession. This means the state is still vulnerable to an economic downturn, but is in a much better economic position than it was in in the early 2000s.